How many lawyers are in the room? Seriously. How many lawyers would be willing to... Never mind. All right, I'm going to piss you off. I've talked to DHS, I've talked to DOD, I've talked to MOUSE, all of them, I've pissed them all off, and they still don't have a freaking clue as to what the hell's going on. <laughs> Napolitano says, we cannot get and find the people we need. I say, bullsh, crap. Dernza, DEFCON, said, you guys are the best security people in the world, we want to hire you. I say, bullsh. Prep. They're both lying through their teeth, with deep respect for my nation's leaders. So let's talk about discrimination, because this is an issue of discrimination that's going to hit the courts not too far in the future. It began on this day in 1969, and I wanted to work for the greatest company in the world. I wanted them to pay for my education, send me to college so I could be a great geeky researcher. Where did I apply for a job? The v DMV? <laughs> He's Dutch, he can't help it. Not IBM. Not DHS in 1969? Dude. AT&T, Bell Labs. It isn't there anymore, and it's a shame. So I went down to see HR. And by the end of this, we are going to have full declared nuclear war on HR, I guarantee you. Went down to HR, and I passed these I can speak English test. I can add two and two test. Give you the whole litany of tests and everything. And they've got it all scoped out, my career, my education. It's going to be awesome. Just one more test. In those days, we didn't have fiber. We had bundles called 2048 pair twisted pair wires. This HR lady holds out a pair to me and says, what color are they? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I'm colorblind. They could not hire me according to corporate policy. Today we would call that discrimination against a medical condition. So after that, I was crying. HR lady was crying. We went out and had some beers. I was 17. It was New York. It's legal. It's fine. So I went then across the street, 56th and Madison, to the second greatest company in the world at the time, which was Xerox. Jesus. That's Rochester, dude. <laughs> IBM, right across the street. And I went into HR and I said, I want you guys to pay for my education. I want to become a researcher up in Armonk. Went through the whole thing, spoke English, did some math tests. Yes, sir, we're going to hire you. You are freaking awesome. Only one thing. You got to go look like Ross Perot. Another form of discrimination. And today, the discrimination I had back in those days, I ended up becoming a record engineer and producer instead. So sex, drug, rock and roll back in 1969 was not such a bad alternative. But today, we've got a completely different set of discriminators that are going on, many of them arbitrary, capricious, and if I'm correct in my predictions of the not too distant future, illegal discriminations against us. We are not all created equal, especially the geeks. <laughs> if you recall, in 1947, when the CIA was set up after the OSS, they only hired people they could trust, and those were squeaky white Mormon men. And that's based upon all the criteria that we had out of World War II. Those are the only ones we could trust. All people are not created equal. Our skill sets are required are substantially different than they have been. Yet we are still living in a Cold War mindset about being able to hire people. And the problem is when we uh, take that model and try to defend nations and networks with today's technology, we are into an epic fail mode. Back then, what did normal look like? By today's standards, it's pretty damned ugly in black and white. Then we have this other set of normal, and to many of us in the community, that's perfectly acceptable. What's the big deal? It's kind of cool. Where's the purple? But can she get hired? Can she get hired, or could Richard Nixon still get hired? So what we've ended up with 
is a normal distribution of people, standard deviations. And they are looking for these people in the middle, the people that are normal, that can pass all of their silly ass tests. But where are the geeks? Where are the geeks? We're at the outer edges of normal because that is what makes us who we are. We don't fit in to the center 30% of what society considers normal. In order to start beginning to fight this, we need to begin as normal with leadership, a fundamental shift in leadership, and take a lesson from the following. I'm going to put you in IT, because you said on your CV you have a lot of experience with computers. <laughs> I did say that on my CV, yes. <laughs> I have a lot of experience with the whole computer thing, you know, emails, sending emails, uh, receiving emails, <laughs> deleting emails. Um, I could go on. <laughs> Do. The web. Using mouse, mices, using mice. Um, clicking, double clicking, um, the computer screen of course, the keyboard, the bit that goes on the floor down there. The hard drive? Correct. Uh -huh. Well, you certainly seem to know your stuff. How many of us have colleagues or bosses with that level of knowledge? Oh, look at all the hands going up. This is obviously not an FBI audience. Unfortunately, that's an awful lot of what we're seeing, and back in the 70s, we called it the Peter Principle. And if you get certain levels of incompetence, you get promoted. So what we need to do is start looking not at what's normal and what's not normal. We need to look at skills. Some of us have got hardware skills. Some have got some cool software school skills. A few of us can program an assembly language in a darkened room. Some of us do architecture. Some of us do all these various things, and not one of us is an expert at everything. And unfortunately, the media and HR think, are you a security expert? Well, if you're a security expert, then you must know everything there is to know about security. And there's a half a dozen of us that run around in our field claiming they do know everything, but they get ostracized pretty damn quickly, because that's bullshit. This is a family audience, so I have to be careful. So we have to really start thinking about skills first, not what you are as a human. And number one, we gotta forget education. What the hell difference does it make if I have an MBA or a bachelor's in Chaucerian English? Does that help me configure a firewall? Does that help me debug bad code? Does it help me do anything? Too many organizations, from the government all the way down to corporate America, and even SMBs, say the first discriminator is, do you have a degree? If you don't have a degree, you're out. I argue that is insanity, because we're automatically disqualifying those people who do not fit in the normal middle end of the curve. That girl that was on the picture with Dernse at DEF CON, 12 years old, and she won the DEF CON zero day contest. You don't get that from becoming a Bachelor of English or Art History. Certifications, certifications are great. But are they the only discriminator? If you pass any of these certification tests, does that make you an expert? It means you pass the damn test. It is another one of these check boxes that HR uses to discriminate against people with skills because they don't have the ability to do the evaluation themselves. So it's easier to say, no, because they don't understand what's going on. We don't teach anywhere in our curriculums the history of computer security. Earlier today, I was talking with another guy with gray hair, and I said, remember Bella Podula? How many of you know Bella Podula? All right, a few of you. The original basis of access control mechanisms developed by Rand in the 1970s for the DOD fundamental to what we're doing today. We don't teach it. I was doing something for Xerox the other day and on their printers and I asked them about object reuse. How many of you know what object reuse is? A few of you. It's a fundamental principle of security in any computing environment. We don't teach the history and the problem is by not teaching the history, 
we're making the same damn mistakes all over again. So here comes the world of mobile. And we're wondering, should we bother adding security? <laughs> BYOD, one of the stupidest things known to man, yet the CISOs are saying, well, the boss wants it, so we better damn well do it. Three native connections always on <laughs> in these devices, and we're going to commingle data and break every single compliance rule in order to make the millennium generation happy that they can have one iPhone instead of two. We're making the same mistakes all over again. And that's something that we only way around it is for getting people to understand where we've been and that the definition of insanity is trying to do the same thing all over again and expect a different result. We've got to start getting politically incorrect. Political correctness is part of what's killing us as an industry. Some would argue killing us as a nation. We have to start thinking very, very differently if we're going to be able to get the right people to do the jobs that we need done. Number one, you're nothing special, dude. We tell our kids, helicopter parents, we all know one of these, tells their kid, you're great at everything. You're wonderful. You're a star. You're numero uno for everything you've ever done in your life. Bull! You suck at soccer. <laughs> you may be really good with video games, but you're never going to be a sports star. Go out and enjoy it, but don't build up false confidences. Look for the skills amplify the skills, find out where the native talent is, and let the kid work for that. Giving him false hopes is a recipe for failure as you may get into adulthood. We don't embrace failure enough. Do you want somebody that works for your organization who has never, ever had a problem with their firewalls, it's always been perfectly configured, everything is great, never had an issue, or do you want the guy or girl who says, I've spent my entire career fixing other people's screw-ups. When something goes really wrong, I know what to do. I've been there. Which one do you want? And what are we turning out of the schools? And what are we turning out of certifications? And what does HR want? HR does not want failure. I, as an IT manager, security guy, I want you to have failed. I want your failures, because that is where you learn. 99% of success comes from failure. We got to start teaching kids that failure is good. If you don't try, you lose. If you don't try, you don't have hope in hell of accomplishing anything. Embrace the failure, learn from the failure, and our organizations are looking for perfection to their own detriment. We got to start embracing the autism spectrum. Two weeks ago, the American International Psychological Association thing of psychiatry, whatever the hell they are, they put it all onto one spectrum. Now it's no longer just Asperger's and crazy people. Now it's the autism spectrum, all the way from mild cases of autism up to full locked in syndrome at the other end. How many of you have some degree of autism or Asperger's? How many of you are in denial? <laughs> if you're a geek, you've got it. If you can sit and solve a problem, you've got it. If you sit down at a computer with an issue and you can't get up for 12 hours even though you have to pee, you've got it. And this is the skill and the basis of the personalities that we're hoping to get because it works. Yet, can somebody with Asperger's get through HR? Can somebody with autism? I got a, one of the guys from one of my companies. He's worked for me for four years. I met him once. I said hello to him, and he did not respond. <laughs> but damn, is he a good coder. We just can't let him out in public. <laughs> Would he ever pass HR? No. Do we need him? Yes. To the less extreme, the guys with Asperger's. The people that can sit and focus on a problem and not let go. Cops have that kind of mentality in many cases. We need to embrace it.
because it's a natural condition. And again, I'm going to argue that whether it's in six months or six years or longer, we're going to look back on these days and say, this was discrimination that hurt us, just as it has been for other forms of discrimination we've experienced as a culture over the years. ADD and ADHD, Edison, Tesla, some of the greatest minds could not get a job because they were too good, too smart, and did not fit into that normal piece of the bell curve. And we need to start embracing these kinds of people. If anybody wants the slides, let me know, and you can read all that crap. <laughs> the other day, it was, in the, it was in the news, CNN, not Drudge or Fox, and this woman went to work, apply for a job at Target. At Target. She failed the personality test. How do you do that? How do you fail a personality test to be a stock clerk at Target? Get fired from the TSA. Get fired from the TSA. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Is personality the number one criteria, or should it be a dominant criteria in the evaluation of who I'm going to hire to defend networks and nation? And I'm arguing, no. Why the hell is HR being that discriminator when they have no earthly clue what they're trying to hire, other than maybe they know how to spell Unix? So what is one of the best ways you actually determine somebody's skills? Everybody here has been to DEF CON, right? Or you're here, and you meet somebody. How long does it take you to find out if they're clueful or not? 30 seconds seems to be the standard geek answer every time I give this talk. It's 30 seconds. And that buys you another five minutes of conversation to find out if you're full of sh crap. Can't say shit in here, I know. The geeks don't get a shot at those people with the skills because HR has already tossed them out because they don't fit societal norms in their view and in their opinion. So then the question comes up, who can you trust? Who can you trust? Well, the argument has been many years, can't hire hackers because they're evil. Can't hire long hairs because they're evil. How do you develop trust? Now, trust is a fundamental component of security. We always say trust, but verify. How can HR, should HR be the one that tells us that I can trust you? Can I trust Jack? Can I trust Gary? At least he's honest about it. <laughs> so how do you know who you can trust to put into these mission critical operational positions when you're having your networks or nation under attack and it's your job to defend? Profiling, politically incorrect, but damn, we need it. Profiling, we as security geeks, we profile for a living. Otherwise, we don't know what's going good and what's bad inside of our networks and computers and communications. We have to do profiling in order to find out where do I spend my additional time. Now, TSA prefers to cop a feel on octogenarians and little kids versus profiling based upon the politically incorrect, you can look into my background and give me special access for $200 a year so I don't have to go through this crap every time. But that's politically incorrect because it's not treating everybody as equal. So they choose instead to choose everybody as equal, yet we as security pros know all code and all systems are not equal. We can profile them and find the problem a lot easier in another way. Now. How do you profile without getting politically incorrect? Hmm, not sure you can. However, anybody ever see the TV show Lie to Me? Yeah, if you haven't seen it, go torrent it from this little place in Sweden called the Pirate Bay. <laughs> Lie to Me is about a honest to God real technology developed about 10 years ago that was in fact adapted by the FBI and hopefully by others. And it looks for micro expressions muscular twitches, very, very small body language or tells, if you will. And I, as the guy that's doing the hiring, I only care about really one thing after I've got your skills down. What is the one word thing that I really care about when I'm 
profiling you. I'm going to get closer and into your space. What do I care about? Can I trust you? But what's the one word I'm looking for you f that I'm going to try to find? Are you being deceptive? Not honest. You can't tell honesty, Gary, but you can identify deception. For those of you who've been through European security, first thing before anything happens, some very nice, attractive 20-something person smiles and says, hi, how are you? They don't give a shit about your answer. They're looking at your reaction, looking for any signs of distress. Where have you been? Have you been having fun? Did you go to the Tower of London? Whatever. One moment of deception, bam, you're into secondary, and then you get the cattle prod. Fair enough. <laughs> Profiling. Only cattle prod those people that are really being suspicious. So we've got to take this approach as well, and we can do it through industrial psychological profiling and the hiring process. I don't care your color, your religion, uh, turbans. I don't care about any of that stuff. Only thing I care about is your deceptiveness. And I'm going to ask you a question. One of them is going to be, if your wife and daughter are kidnapped, will you turn against my company? Probably. At least it's an honest answer. Anything else is probably deceptive. Probably deceptive. And there are standard sets of questions that work into this to find out, do you fit in, and how trustworthy are you? However, we failed. The best and the brightest failed. Our lead CIA counterintelligence officer worked for the Russians. Our lead FBI counterintelligence officer worked for the Russians. How did this happen? Because we didn't do re-vetting, we didn't do psychological profiling. They fundamentally screwed up. For years and years, they screwed up. And again, this is not rocket science here. You got people in mission critical positions in your organization. Part of the deal is, I got to check you out periodically just to make sure. And if you have a problem with that, go find a job somewhere else. There's a reasonable discriminator, in my humble opinion. We've got to redefine clearances. The concept of binary clearance, that it's unclassified or classified, is a Cold War relic. And it was meant for a couple of very distinct things. And the first big one was nuclear secrets, obviously operational mission plans for the military. But the big one initially was uh, nuclear secrets. And the second one, back in the late 40s and early 50s, was crypt cryptography. And from a national standpoint, if you were dealing with crypto, you were probably going to get locked up. Now today, working in a private sector, working in the military, do you need a secret clearance to defend a network? They say you do. I say we need to redefine them. Redefine them for the reality of the job. I'm a network administrator at the Pentagon. BFD, that I have a clearance. You want to check me out? I don't want to see the secrets. I want to keep the network running. Periodically check me out. I don't care. But why should I have to go through every single one of the polys and the lifestyles and all of these other things? Do they have an impact on my ability to do the job? So we have to completely redefine this. And this goes against the complete culture of the government right now. They're not happy when I talk about this one at all. And when you take that same mindset over into the private sector, so now, it's a very similar condition. It has nothing to do with secret. It's, I'm going to dig into your background. I'm going to probe you. And the HR's job is to find something wrong so they don't have to hire you. So we say no to great geeks. One buddy of mine, super, super great penetration tester, used to work for the, a lot of stuff for the, for the government before the rules changed. And he had a stock deal with a company that was going to go public, took the stock. The stock got collapsed, but he had to take it as ordinary income. He got hit with a $100,000 tax bill, didn't have a spare $100,000. And now they revoked his clearance because he is financially untrustworthy. Does this make sense? No, it doesn't. You have a relative in jail. They're going to find a reason not to hire you. 
HR doesn't want you. HR wants normal. However, one company started to get around the room, around the rules. And getting around those rules meant hiring the unhirable, and they actually pulled it off. And when I publicized this a few weeks ago at a DHS conference, they got a little bit upset, shall we say. Because now that meant more government scrutiny, because the government expects its contractors to adhere to the same hiring rules, and things started getting into a cluster there. Had a meeting with some friends at DEF CON, guy from a contractor wanted to hire somebody else. Oh, you meet Bob over here, got him to meet, and anything wrong with you? Yeah, I'm Canadian. Couldn't hire him because he was Canadian. Again, arbitrary discrimination. Other capricious stuff we're going through. Ageism, I couldn't, I can't get hired anywhere my age. Probably couldn't get hired when I was 30 either. But we throw out our best and brightest. Forced mandatory retirements. But we don't have a system that the academics have of using a merit of status. Just because I hit 55, hit 60, forced mandatory, all of my knowledge now is gone and useless and has no value to an organization. That's the way we treat it. And it's insane that we do this. Failing aptitude tests. Well, you're, don't, you have no aptitude for security and no aptitude for computers. But I do zero days. HR doesn't get it. The lawyers don't get it. Nine to five, throw it out. People do not turn on Asperger's at nine, turn it off at five, and suddenly you get your creative genes going. Doesn't happen. We have to get over and get used to the fact that some guys are gonna come to work on Tuesday at midnight, stay there for 49 hours, solve the problem, go home, and they'll be back in a few days. Get over it. Stop drug testing, my God. <laughs> don't ask, don't tell. We can have raging alcoholics. We can have multiple DUIs. We put them through how many rounds of rehab, because that's a medical condition, but if you smoke a little weed on the weekend, you're unhirable. Does this make sense? I'm not suggesting we hire drug addicts. I am suggesting don't ask, don't tell, and monitor your employees to see if they're doing their damn job. Keep their personal lives the hell out of it, and that rule is going to change. Kids are saying no. My son has ADHD, diagnosed right in, in, in high school. You know what the prescription for ADHD is? Methamphetamine. They give him speed. You know what the other illegal drug really works is that you can get in California, Colorado, Massachusetts, and nine other states? Little weed. Which one do you want your kids to have, methamphetamine or a little weed? My son got recruited by the NSA with a bunch of other really, really smart kids from uh, the, out of their high school, went up to Boston University under scholarship, and they were gonna go become NSA geeks. Cool, I support you, no problem. About six weeks into it, they all said, we quit. We did a little bit of research. Smart kids, internet, research. They found out what they were going to have to become and how they were going to have to live under what sort of rules. And they said, pass. We're losing some of our best and brightest for our arbitrariness. And you've got competition. Corporate America's got competition, not only amongst itself, but government agencies. However, they all operate by the same set of rules. We don't want to be able to hire anybody outside that center 30%. The other guys don't qualify. So we, we're looking for the really the best and brightest that fit into our mold of what normal is. But on the other side, you get organized crime. Do they give a crap about what you do on weekends? They care about your education and your certifications? What do they care about? Results, exactly. They care about one thing, and they pay really, really well. Nation states, they're hiring the unhirables as well. We're losing our talent to the very people that we're trying to defend against. So if we hire the unhirables, you just can't jam them into a normal environment. You've got to do a few things. Number one, let them go to cons. Send them to cons. They want to go to hacker con, good. But you don't need to. Yes, I do. Why? I don't know yet, but I'll find out. You meet some people. You create the networks. Embrace that. Own your own IP. 
yeah, if I go to work for a company and I'm developing a project for you, it's yours. But if I develop a tool on my own time over the weekend that helps me do my job, you should not own it. Most hiring contracts say you will. It's wrong. Let me own my own IP that I've used, that I've developed on my own time, and read the fine print of these things. Support systems. We support the physically handicapped. We support, in some cases, mental aberrations or differences. We support the hell out of the alcohol abusers, but we don't have a mechanism for supporting those people that are on the periphery of this normal curve. We have to begin building infrastructure and process to be able to support the people that are a little bit different. Get over the meetings. Next. <laughs> Give them access to some cool technology. If you're a big company, you got some cool technology. Let people screw around with it. In order to defend, you have to be able to attack. Build a hostile environment in your organization. Don't tie it to the rest of your network. <laughs> Just saying. Let your geeks screw around with it. Let them have their war games. They need it, and it's good for you. And what should you expect from these guys? You never know what to expect. And that's one of the reasons you guys are here, because a lot of us fit into these types of things. Brutal honesty. I'm not going to kiss your ass because you're my boss. You want an answer? I'm going to give you an answer. You don't like the answer? That's on you, not on me. <laughs> Yeah, this is all of our offices. So we've got all of these things that are very, very different. And people, HR and lawyers, need to get over it. And the lawyers are coming. And this is actually a case where the lawyers could help, believe it or not. Because the lawyers are the ones who've created the hell that we're in now. And I challenge the lawyers and HR, but more importantly the lawyers, you got us into this mess, now figure out how to get us out. Help us create systems, create processes, rewrite the rules in such a way that we can hire the people that you tell us you can't. And don't tell me you can't do it. There is a way to be able to hire the right folks. Somehow, there is. Because when adversarial system, yes and no, let's start coming up with ways to say yes. I've heard people say, it's too hard. Bullshit, it's too hard. We got to the moon. In eight years, we created and redefined warfare in six years. Two incredible national achievements. Done lots of incredible things. Yet we can't find a way to embrace the best and brightest that we have and are developing for the future. No, oh, find a way to do it. We spend an awful lot of time looking for excuses as a culture. It's a cover your ass way to stay hired, to maintain your control inside of an HR legal environment, because you're taking no chances. If we took no chances, we wouldn't be where we are today. Thank you for your comments. And this is uh, my latest project, self-promotion. And it'll be up on Kickstarter in a couple of weeks. And the point is, I want to take all of the stuff we're talking about and have been talking about, and I've been doing it for 30 years, I want to do it for kids and families. So if you want to take a look at it at Kickstarter in a couple weeks, I'd appreciate it. And I'm here to answer any questions or comments you might have. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>